all of us, of course, since the end of last week, uh, will now give CGS credit for extraordinary perspicacity uh, and powers of divination. Uh, it is uh, breeding in me a different sense of what it means to be a Scottish Unionist um, as I confront the paradoxes of potential statelessness, I think. Um, the real issue, of course, and Rob's sort of referred to it, is that whenever we're talking about war, uncertainty and adaptability should be at the forefront of our thinking. Um, Clausewitz uh, uh, made the point, uh, and many have done so subsequently. But where I want to begin is not with that, but with policy and politics, as we probably should after last week. Uh, Colin Gray, whom I don't often quote with approbation, but I certainly do on this case, uh, said uh, policy can change on a dime. Um, and what he reflects is that politicians, and again, we don't need much reminding of this, have an appetite for risk, which many of those in uniform who can be more sensitive of its consequences do not necessarily share. Um, they live in a world where contingency and a capacity to respond uh, is central to what they do. Um, and they live essentially on a day-to-day, -day, uh, in a day-to-day -day environment, increasingly so uh, because of their sensitivity to the pressures of the media. There is a paradox here because for those, is, those of us in the West, uh, we have a profound belief uh, bordering on stupidity at times in an expectation of stability and continuity. Um, indeed, a faith reinforced by something Rob just referred to, this idea of the Cold War as an era of peace and stability, which is not how it felt for many at the time, for most of the time. Um, and we have therefore taken you know, an era of persistent threat of an all-out nuclear exchange and the possibility of major war as somehow a good place to have been, uh, which says something about us as much as it says something about the era in, in question. Um, that sense of security, though, since 1945, has enabled something extraordinary, which is, and I, forgive me if I've done my sums wrong, because this was written on the train coming down last night, uh, and I had no immediate access to uh, the, uh, the, the, the resources that might have enabled me to get my figures right. But we've seen roughly a threefold expansion in the number of states in the world in the last 70 years. We have almost 200 of them now. In the 19th century, states aggregated rather than disaggregated. Germany and Italy unified, uh, not least, of course, because state size and the capacities and resources which each state uh, mastered was a definition of their capability. They could create bigger armies, they could create bigger, bigger navies, they had more control of their economic resources. Since 1945, states have disaggregated. And I began with a point which, of course, refers to the possibility of this particular state disaggregating. And we've been able to do that in part because of the comparative security which the, the institutions of collective defense have enabled us uh, to proliferate. You know, multinational organizations like NATO have provided security for small states as well as big states, even if, of course, the only time um, that Article 5 has been invoked has been in support of the big state uh, rather than the smaller states. The result, I think, of all this has been to put strategy itself in a very odd place. In the 19th century, strategy, to quote Clausewitz the second time in three minutes, crikey, this is getting bad, uh, to use Clausewitz's definition, Strategy was the use of the battle for the purposes of the war. In other words, uh, strategy thrived on contingency, on seizing the initiative, on taking risk, on exploiting opportunities. Today, we have come to see strategy in almost polar opposite terms. We see it in terms of mitigating th uh, threats, not of exploiting them, of managing risk rather than utilizing risk. 21st century strategy, instead of welcoming uncertainty, is frightened by it. And nowhere is that more evident than our reaction to the behavior of Russia and of President Putin. Putin uses strategy in opportunistic ways. He exploits vulnerability, uh, and he exploits our inability 
to understand the opportunities which vulnerability create. It, it, he shows exactly what we have lost in terms of how we approach strategy. Caution produces delay till it's too late. It becomes a sign of weakness and irresolution uh, and makes us ripe for yet further exploitation. But our incoherence is not due simply to our caution. It is also due to a mismatch between policy and strategy, which go, goes beyond policy's greater happiness with the realm of contingency and chance. Since 9-11, our politicians have set goals which have elevated big ideas. The rule of law, indeed, CGS referred to that just now, the rule of law of a rules-based international order. Uh, the speed uh, uh, and the spread, I beg your pardon, of democracy, the protection of human rights, and so on and so forth, all presented in terms which are universal and global. And of course, we welcome those as universal and global ambitions and think as democratic states that they are right and proper. And at the same time, of course, they have historic purchase. We think that's what we've been about for most of the 20th century. They are given leverage uh, by an interpretation of the Second World War, which sees it as the good war, uh, the war in which democratic liberal powers triumphed over fascism, and indeed by the Cold War, which can also be seen as the triumph of democratic powers uh, over communism. Since 9-11, we've ramped up the rhetoric further by, and this is an extraordinary development if we reflect on it, challenging the principle of national sovereignty enshrined in the UN Charter. Uh, beginning, of course, uh, with Tony Blair's Chicago speech in 1999, um, and being carried through in 2005 uh, by the UN's embracing the principle of the responsibility to protect. During the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Libya in 2011, the US and its allies, or NATO, depending on which conflict you're talk talking about, spoke in these universalist terms, but failed to match what they preached with what they did. And in 2016, we're in a situation where Syria reveals the massive gap between our own rhetoric and our own substance. Uh, the outgoing prime minister has, by my calculation, three times declared that we in Britain confronted an existential threat. And yet in none of them did the UK government respond in terms that were commensurate with the scale that matched those words. The West has tended to overpromise and underdeliver instead of under-promising and over-delivering. And strategically, the effect has been disastrous. It undermines our deterrent posture and elevates confusion in the minds of our own publics. And now we have a further challenge in this vocabulary of global democracy. During the Cold War, NATO defined itself as an alliance of democratic powers facing an alliance of communist powers in the shape of the Warsaw Pact. NATO has tended to forget that it also defined itself uh, not just in ideological terms, uh, but also in geographical terms, as a North Atlantic alliance, as the West versus the East, if you like. Both those are geographical terms. And the recovery, and this is an extraordinary recovery, uh, the re-entry of the word geopolitics into our vocabulary in the last 10 years uh, it seems to be symptomatic of what is going on here. When I first went to Oxford, I inherited responsibility for something called the Mackinder Forum that was to look at geopolitics. And my colleague, Adam Roberts, the Professor of International Relations, said, of course, it really has nothing to do with the world as we currently know it. Um, and geopolitics is a word I find deeply unhelpful. In 2016, you cannot open a paper uh, without geopolitics being used in ways that are as profligate as the way in which the papers used to use the word strategy or strategic. Or perhaps they still do that too. But actually, geopolitics has acted as a substitute for strategy. It is, in other words, everywhere. But the revival of geopolitics should not lead us to conclude that its British founder, whose name I've just mentioned, so it's not just Clausewitz I'm mentioning, uh, Halford Mackinder, uh, was right. For Mackinder, in 1904, when he gave his famous lecture at the Royal Geographical Society, uh, 
the geopolitical pivot of history uh, was the Euro-Asian heartland. In practice, as NATO implicitly recognized, the geopolitical pivot of history for many in this country during the course of the 20th century was not a continent but an ocean, the Atlantic. Um, and at least for Britain and its relationship with the United States in two world wars, and probably for the most of the west, west of Europe, uh, that relationship was central. Um, the ability to draw on the resources of the rest of the world precisely to generate the sort of mass uh, and the ongoing capability, uh, or at least to fund and equip that mass, was central. In the 21st century, uh, the US thinks uh, that the geopolitical pivot of history seems to be less the Atlantic than the Pacific, at least if we take the President's uh, speech of January 2012, uh, and the US is pivoting, if not actually fully shifting, in that direction. Now, geopolitics is not the vocabulary of global values. It is the vocabulary of regionalism and of economic and strategic self-interest, which is precisely, in my mind, why it has become popular. Our failure to realize it is creating status as our political vocabulary and our strategic interests increasingly diverge. So in the Pacific, you have countries like Singapore and Australia pursuing closer economic relationships with China, but increasingly close defense relationships with the United States. In the United Kingdom itself, we pursue uh, an economic relationship with China while still cleaving to an alliance with the United States whose own relationships with China are as much defined in terms of military confrontation as of economic cooperation. Our Five Eyes intelligence relationships are all with Pacific powers, Australia, New Zealand, Canada as well as the United States, while we currently would not define ourselves as a Pacific power. Do we follow them into the Pacific? Or do we focus on what we might call our near abroad, Scandinavia, Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East? Are the, and are these divergences between our political ambition and our military and economic resources in danger of being deepened by two further broad trends? The first is the broad trend, which I would see as the continuing fallout from the 2008-09 crash, uh, the mismatch between uh, the global subscription to free trade and its principles, and an increasing and underlying drift towards economic autarky as states seek a sustained recovery um, within their own terms rather than necessarily through trading principles. And now, of course, in our own case, Brexit, which seems to be to imply another divergence between how we define our economic behavior and what we see as our strategic interests. And this other secondary issue, not secondary in the sense of being secondary in importance, is the impact of climate change, which, picking up, up that point about autarky, implies that a state's direct control of resources, not just of uh, fossil fuels and of oil and coal and so on, but also of water, and of sustainable agricultural systems are increasingly important, and which make the drift towards small states harder and harder to understand when actually one of the virtues of size is that you are likely to control more of those resources rather than less of them. So, and I'm probably almost out of my time, but I, Rob, have I got a few more minutes, three or four? He knows what to do when he's told sometimes. Um, so what does the military do when the gap between political ambition and the resources available for its delivery makes the goals set by policy seemingly hard themselves to deliver? What does the military do when the military and its use of war are, de are in danger of being robbed of the utility which the military would like? It does what it has done continuously over the last 25 years. Its response to political uncertainty has been reflected by a determination to create an element of certainty at the operational level. I remember, I'm dating myself, in 1991, going to see, speak to 16 Air Assault Brigade with then CGS Peter Inge and Hugh Pike uh, as the land commander, 
and the lack of an obvious scenario was really worrying them. So, of course, they fell back on what was then the operational solution, which was the British way in warfare. It's very striking, CGS. I don't think that is one of the topics for today's discussion. Wonderfully. Uh, but if we review the history of military concepts since 1990, the revolution in military affairs, network uh, enable capability, transformation, counterinsurgency, hybrid warfare, gray zone operations, all the, the buzzwords of the day. Uh, if we review those, those have been attempts to provide characterizations of current conflict which put them into some sort of set of common definitions. Uh, I'll come back to one or two of them very briefly in a moment. They are, if you like, the general's way of over-promising and under-delivering because they present themselves as universal models applicable over time and across different theaters of war, when in practice, of course, they struggle to do any of those things. And in practice, they get in the way of exactly what CGS has just demanded that you do, which is to think adaptably and flexibly. It requires you to get the old idea out and the new idea in. And NATO is particularly vulnerable to these doctrinal and operational pressures. Precisely because if NATO adopts a doctrine, there has to be a degree of international buy-in. Uh, the alliance, after all, is made up of independent, sovereign, and democratic states, each of which takes its cue from its capital city. But NATO is actually delivered by you guys in the room, by its armed forces, which share a common professional ethos. Uh, which, uh, who are uh, able to speak to each other across national boundaries precisely because you have common operational concepts and, uh, and thinking. If NATO has delivered in Afghanistan, it is in part because the alliance of, at its peak, uh, over 50 countries, including, of course, the associated countries, managed to operate together and hold together. An extraordinary achievement. Uh, it could, in other words, do the means, but we're not at all clear if it has delivered on its objectives. Indeed, the objectives in these recent operations have often been trumped by the way in which they have been done. Counterinsurgency, in many respects, became an end in itself rather than the means to an end, and I've spoken about that before. Strategy effectively became the policy i.e. not a strategy if a strategy is using war for the purposes of policy, uh, which is what it should, of course, be doing. We have let the means become the ends, and we have used metrics to talk of progress for years without getting ever any closer to the end. And now we're doing it again with a way in which we are magnifying hybrid warfare and gray zone warfare. As with other doctrines within NATO, hybrid warfare means different things to different states. Uh, at its worst, uh, it, 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 it is, and it is worse at the political level as opposed to the operational level. For Germany or for the Baltic states, hybrid warfare is code for speaking about Russia. But of course, if you're a Southern Atlantic NATO partner, it's code for perhaps speaking about ISIS. Um, and yet, of course, wars have specific contexts and are fought against specific enemies and sure, it is, surely it is better to put them clearly in their political and, ter and geographical context than not. So what do we do? Well, self-evidently, I am singing to CGS's hymn sheet in that there is a need for adaptability uh, and a recognition that we've not done it terribly well. Um, if there's one thing I hope that comes out of Chilcot, it is to look at that pivotal year 2005-06, perhaps 2006-07, when, quite frankly, the British Army didn't do very well in its capacity to adapt. But we also, I think, need to recognize that how we fight uh, will be a product of whom we fight and where we fight. It will be politically and geographically determined, not operationally designed in the first instance. And that is a challenge for Britain, whose immediate neighbors, whatever our current state of the relationship, are unlikely to become so fractious that that we're talking about the use of armed force. Um, and it is also problematic for Britain because, of course, of the expeditionary nature uh, of how it will fight and the varieties of options that that uh, proposes. In other words, 
Uh, what I'm saying is, of course, war is shaped by policy. Uh, and if policy is indeed the realm of contingent, uh, then uh, those will be the determining conditions. My second point is the value of concepts of limited war. And it doesn't mean that I'm saying there isn't the danger of uh, uh, having to fight what CGS call war, calls wars at scale or the need to generate mass. But what it does mean is the need to align our political ambitions uh, with the resources that we're prepared to devote with them uh, rather than to see them in constantly diverging directions. Um, so that strategy uh, can link policy to war and can become uh, coherent again. The third point uh, may be the need to disaggregate the threats that we face rather than to aggregate them. The global war on terror, the long war, hybrid war, quite frankly, are not helpful in terms of identifying specific threats. Uh, the ramping up of the rhetoric gets in the way of clear analysis. Fourthly, there is, of course, and CGS is absolutely rightly reminded of this, that if we do the need to be able to think through how we can mobilize across society if the need arises, uh, if limitation fails, the need to generate mass. If there is one lesson we should draw from this centenary period, it is precisely that. Uh, a British army reckoning uh, exactly as it might at the moment that it would fight limited operations at a distance confronted with something much, much bigger um, and the institutional challenges that confronts, particularly at senior level. Generating sufficient commanders and staff officers was the greatest challenge of all. And finally, of course, I suppose that means if there is a problem, you clout and you don't dribble. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh. So from policy and strategy and their implications, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to James Sladden, a former Royal Marine, you can tell by his webbed feet. Um, he now works for RAND Europe, uh, where he works on defense security and infrastructure research group uh, work. Um, he's worked in the Ukraine, which I think would be particularly interesting to people here, and he has an, uh, a very excellent result from his MA at the Strategy and Security Institute from the University of Exeter. James, um, he's going to address, uh, if you'd like to take the podium, uh, he's going to address the realities of state-based threats um, and the spectrum of conventional operations and information warfare in our contemporary and Eastern European environment. James. Thank you. Uh, sirs, Marms, good morning. Uh, and firstly, uh, thank you to Rusi for the invitation to speak. Uh, as Dr. Johnson has said, I currently work for RAND Europe, uh, which is a not-for-profit and non-partisan research institute. And today I'm going to propose some ideas on state threats in order to stir some debate. Uh, like many others on this issue, my views are constantly being shaped and changed by both events as they unfold uh, and evidence as it emerges. What I have to say doesn't represent the view of RAND. Indeed, the joy of working at an organization as diverse as RAND is that there never really is one view. What outsiders perceive as the RAND view is actually the brief pause in between debates where you catch your breath before your colleagues set at you with their next questions and challenges. Prior to working at RAND, I worked as an international monitor uh, in eastern Ukraine, and so I saw some of the conflict firsthand. And since then, uh, I have returned to Ukraine as a researcher with an interest in that area. There is a danger of uh, insight derived from experience uh, on the ground. You feel like you are viewing the world in high definition and in the wide screen, but in reality, you only ever really get a tiny snapshot of a much broader canvas. This photograph uh, behind me uh, is taken in no man's land of Ukraine. On the high ground is the separatist lines behind me are the Ukrainian lines, uh, and I stood in the middle in a war that I'd never, of a sort I'd never seen before, because that wasn't the war which my generation fought, uh, and a war which, at that point in time, I really didn't understand. So my comments today will draw uh, on the research over the last year, flavored by some experiences. 
I'm going to make three propositions. Uh, none are absolute. All are focused on Russia and Eastern Europe. And this is in order to bound what is otherwise a very wide-ranging discussion. First, I want to offer a characterization of the, of the conflict in eastern Ukraine as follows. What is new is not necessarily interesting, and what is interesting is not necessarily new. Second, it has been suggested that we live in an age of uncertainty, but I propose with regards to state-based threats that we live in a world of unknown knowns. And finally, I would suggest that whilst we may, for a time, have lost interest in potential state adversaries and competitors, they never lost interest in us. And therefore, they developed capabilities uh, to attack our vulnerabilities and our seams. First, the, the war in eastern Ukraine. The story of the conflict uh, is untidy, uncomfortable, and deeply unsettling. The character of the war in Ukraine is not the future. I'm not going to suggest to you that it is the war that the British Army is going to fight next, but I do suggest that it offers a window on one possible type of future amongst many others. It is a combined arms war employing tanks, armored fighting vehicles, light infantry, mercenaries, separatist forces, and it is a battlefield made up of trenches and bunkers. Um, I'll take a guess and say that a portion of this room looks at that photo and is excited at seeing a tank which looks like it's going to be used for what it was designed for. The other portion of the room didn't see the tank. You saw the trench which you know you're going to have to dig and then fight from. There is widespread use of mass fires for area effect. They're using 120 millimeter mortars, 122 and 155 artillery, extensive use of rockets, and the alleged use of tactical ballistic missiles. Because of these factors, and because it is a mass force against mass force, it is a very bloody conflict. The war embraces and indeed was born uh, from I think is a sort of uniquely Russian approach, a comprehensive approach, or what we, what we might call the full spectrum approach, making use of everything from special forces to proxy groups, and then in areas that have been seized, you can see security sector reform, installation of local governance, and governance initiatives. It's also their sort of variant on the whole force approach, except their whole force is broader than ours, because it allegedly draws on elements of the grey and the black economy. What is noticeable out there is the absence of air power. The airspace has been shut down in eastern Ukraine. It is area access and area denial made real. None of this is particularly new. I think it is, however, instructive and of value for armies to study and understand. What is new is the use of information operations, embracing all forms of social media. It is the widespread use of modern electronic warfare, of cyber activities and UAVs. Only the other week, uh, an OSCE drone was brought down shortly after photographing uh, an electronic warfare field facility in the separatist areas. Now, saying that some of these more uh, modern actions are new but not necessarily interesting is not to dismiss them, but instead, I would emphasize that it is action on the ground employing a, a mixed means of more well-established forms of warfare that has determined outcomes. My second proposition. We live in a world of unknown knowns. You will all recall Donald Rumsfeld's famous foray into public philosophy, in which he observed that there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. While the philosopher Slavoj Žižek later suggested that Rumsfeld forgot to add a fourth category, the unknown knowns. These are the things that we know, but we don't realize or remember that we know. State-based threats are not necessarily uncertain. We have a pretty good idea about them if we know where to look, 
or who to ask. We may be lacking institutional knowledge about Russia, but that can be regained, and we do have some. When in Ukraine, it was very clear to me from a military point of view uh, that nothing I was seeing was previously unknown or uncertain. It was just new to me. However, the toolkit that the British used in Iraq and Helmand is not the toolkit that is being used in the Donbass. The question for the army as an institution that wants to think and be able to adapt is to ask, what are the forgotten knowns? What are the elements of the profession of land warfare that, is e that has either been forgotten about or that the army knows but doesn't realize? If we accept that state-based threats must be taken seriously, where or with whom are the repositories of knowledge inside the organization? Or if we don't have them, where or how can we learn about the world in which we must operate? I would say that there are many windows in the world, but the point of a window is you've got to go and look through it to learn. My third proposition. Our adversaries uh, and potential uh, competitors have developed capabilities to attack our vulnerabilities uh, and the organizational and multinational seams. Here I'm reminded of Trotsky's famous warning that you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Put another way, we lost interest in them, but they didn't lose interest in us. There has been some outstanding research uh, on state-based capabilities uh, and capacities. If you look at the work of Dr. Igor Sutjagen, or Sarah Lane here at Rusi, or Andrew Monaghan, or Keir Giles at Chatham House, or indeed of my RAND colleagues, uh, there is a lot of detailed analysis out there. So instead, what I'm going to do is uh, make some broader points drawing on these insights. When you look at capabilities across the spectrum of conflict, it is clear that the Russians have thought about where our vulnerabilities are, where our seams are, and they focused on developing means to attack or exploit them. Our seams. They seek to use measures short of war to undermine alliance and multinational cohesion. They appear to understand where our thresholds are and, they, and how to operate underneath them in order to avoid decisive action on our part. If the Russians do act, it is likely that they will seek to achieve their objective and terminate conflict quickly. They will do this through a concentrated effort to achieve surprise and the coordinated use of forces across all domains. Their focus is likely to be on undermining our seams of efficiency by degrading, disrupting, or destroying our command and control through electronic warfare, cyber operations, fires, or direct action. They will want to do this before we can bring a superior, long-term, potential military power to bear. The implication for the army is that if you are relying on getting to the fight, uh, it might be over before you get there. Our vulnerabilities. The Russians have invested heavily in electronic warfare. They now have electronic warfare companies in every brigade to subvert our precision weapons. Ground-based air defense. Uh, I mentioned that the airspace in eastern Ukraine has been shut down, understandably, to air support. So what sort of war can we fight in a contested airspace with very limited air support? If we begin to turn down the dial of air support from 100% to 50% to 20% air support to ground forces, what does the ground war look like? They overmatch us in their use of mass fires for area effects. They have numerically superior artillery that has a broader range of munitions available and the ability to strike at longer ranges. We have ceded the use of mass area fires, and there were good reasons for that. We now need to account for it, though. They have a variety of sensors, including ground-based uh, surveillance radars and UAVs that can be employed to isolate and target us, especially our headquarters. They have invested in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities to permit them to mass fires quickly and effectively. So against a threat like that, how survivable are our forces? We don't have the numbers that we're used to. Are we training and equipping our land forces to survive a contested fight against a peer adversary? I'll put this another way, conscious of the seniority of the audience I'm speaking to. 
given all the threats I've just outlined, I can confidently state to you uh, that in the, in the event of another state-on-state -state or peer-near-peer -peer conflicts, the last place you're going to find me is in a, in a divisional or brigade headquarters. I'd sooner take my chances in the trenches. In summary, the Russians have retained many of the conventional combat capabilities that the US and UK militaries chose to de-emphasize or remove from our forces in order to optimize our forces for conflicts elsewhere. That was entirely understandable, but now we need to take account of something different. <coughs> Two notes of caution on what I've just said. Firstly, let us acknowledge that direct conflict with Russia is very unlikely. However, if there is a threat, uh, then it is the Army's job to examine the risks and determine what, if anything, should be done. Second, many of Russia's strengths are tied to geography. They are strongest closer to home, and they are less able to project these capabilities overseas. However, as you're seeing in Syria, this is slowly changing. You can't have a seamless organization. We divide and organize in order to support forms of action. However, we need to look at where the seams are in both the land and the joint environment and ask if we have the right capabilities in the right places within the organization. And the seams are multiplied when you move into the multinational uh, space and rely on interoperability. We are trying to make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. They are seeking to ensure we never produce a meaningful whole. To conclude, I think the most important point to realize is that we have become used to marking our own homework. We are used to having escalation dominance over our adversaries, escalation control and overmatch. This got us out of trouble when our homework wasn't up to scratch. Even when we didn't win, we never really lost. The point of a peer or near peer conflict is that whilst we're marking our own homework today, someone else will be marking it tomorrow and they have the ability to hurt us if we are not rigorous enough. They will also not make their plans convenient for us. Our assumptions will be rapidly and painfully exposed. Even if you do not accept the possibility of peer or near-peer conflict, understand that it is very likely that our forces will face some of the equipment that is being sold and exported around the world by our potential competitors and the advice and the training that goes with that equipment. Now, I'm always conscious of speaking to a military community uh, that my, re my remarks on the conflict in Ukraine can be taken one of two ways. One part of the community will hear combined arms warfare and declare that it's back to the good old days, back to basics and what we used to do. The other half of the community will decide that everything is new, needs new labels, new concepts, new technology and new organizations. Neither side is right and to stop you cheating, the answer doesn't lie in the middle. State-based threats are not necessarily uncertainties. The context of situations will always be unique and uncertain, but the capabilities and threats are actually neglected, unfashionable, or forgotten knowns. We know about them. We know more than we think. There is plenty of evidence out there for us to conduct meaningful research in order to form useful views. The challenge is, therefore, to assess the present character of conflict correctly and look as far afield or as far back as is necessary. It is also to mark our homework as if we were our potential adversaries. Thank you. And now our final speaker, um, who is from RAND in the United States, not to be confused with RAND Europe. Um, who uh, I think is well known to a number of people actually. She's been uh, an advisor to people within the US administration and the military. Um, has produced a fantastic study uh, called the, you know, on issues of strategic competence after 13 years of war, which I've used extensively uh, myself. Um, and of course other works, which you may be familiar with, um, uh, Show Me How This Ends, of course written uh, about the midst of the Iraq War and the Iraq Study Group. Um, Linda will be speaking um, on the comparative or contrasting characteristics of low-intensity non-state conflicts and human security implications, as well as the challenges confronting threats with conventional force. Linda, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Rob, and it's a true pleasure uh, to be here. I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion and share a panel with such distinguished uh, colleagues and luminaries. I also would like to co uh, congratulate the conference organizers and the uh, British Army for selecting this topic of adaptability. Um, I uh, spent yesterday with Brigadiers Aitken and Toomey, and uh, it was a very uh, fruitful day uh, to see the work going on, uh, both in the working of the integrated approach into the capstone uh, doctrine, and I believe that that doctrine has uh, really great utility for the U.S. and for the combined allied uh, forces. So I, I look forward to uh, looking at how synergies might develop out of the thinking that you're doing. And with the 77th Brigade, I think that the non-kinetic uses of the military, which is one of the themes we've already touched on here, I will go into that in some depth. Um, I think quite a lot of work in this idea of the Type B reserves could be quite useful. So, and I know that we on the panel look forward to a robust discussion. Uh, I, am, I have uh, a number of points that I want to make. I'm going to stray a little bit beyond my bounds of the non-state um, uh, assignment, non-state actor assignment that I've been given. Uh, but I, I trust uh, in the spirit of addressing war is war after all, um, you'll give me some latitude. Uh, I want to start by saying I think adaptability is a vital issue for three reasons. Uh, the cost cr constraints require it, uh, as uh, General Cernick has already uh, mentioned. The multiplicity of threats today require it. And the adaptability of individual adversaries uh, requires it. And this is the topic that I will address in particular. The adaptations of non-state actors and particularly ISIL as the latest version uh, and what that means for the UK, the US and its allies. I do want to make a caveat here right at the outset in keeping with some of the comments that have already been made. And that is that my view is that we should focus as much on what the adversary is doing as much as what the type of adversary is. Uh, in other words, state and non-state actors use many, if not most, of the same toolkit. The major exception, of course, has been the high-end weaponry and particularly weapons of mass destruction, as well as air power. Although non-state actors are certainly gaining access, uh, certainly their use of ISR uh, drones and so forth is quite um, uh, common now. Uh, the state actors can and do employ many of the tactics, techniques, and procedures that I am uh, discussing. And the reason is that irregular or asymmetric means present options for achieving ends at less expense. And the least costly of all is reflexive control, to use a term from the Soviet era. Uh, i.e. to force the opponent to make errors and delegitimize its cause is the cheapest way of all of winning a war. Now I would like to turn to what I see as the chief features of the evolution of non-state actors in the recent period. And I would like to footnote a few uh, uh, projects that I have worked on that um, undergird the observations that I'm going to make. Uh, first is about eight years ago, I participated in a, a joint operating concept on irregular warfare uh, as a member of a large group and as the principal uh, pen on the paper in this exercise. It was a US interagency and allied uh, endeavor. The um, work that I've done over the last two years on ISIL uh, forms and ISIL is the U.S. term for the Islamic State uh, in Iraq and the Levant. Here, I believe Daesh is the preferred term, so forgive me for uh, the word soup. I will usually uh, refer to ISIL uh, to uh, refer to this group. And then finally, over the last year, I have been leading a project on political warfare using the uh, George Kennan definition, and that looks at measures short of war uh, and we are looking not only at the state use of it, which was the common 
uh, parameter in the Cold War era, but we are looking at both state and non-state practices short of conventional war. So I would like to spell out, I think, six traits, uh, trends that I see with regard to non-state actors, and then I will illustrate them with uh, the ISIL, uh, the Islamic State, in practice as I've watched it over the last two years. Non-state actors, I would submit, are growing more potent. Non-state actors are learning from each iteration. So they have each form of uh, non-state warfare that we have seen has built quite explicitly on the past iterations. They, the non-state actor always retains the ability to move back to guerrilla warfare, and in that mode stands a decent chance, a decent chance of success or at least avoidance of defeat. According to a catalog uh, compiled by my RAND colleague Seth Jones, out of 181 conflicts since uh, 1946, the non-state actor has won 30% of the time and has achieved a draw 29% of the time. And that includes uh, settlements where some of their original program has been achieved uh, at the bargaining uh, table. Uh, number four, the non-state actor has a reasonable chance of counting on our inability uh, to successfully conduct phase four and phase five. Uh, and stabilization uh, is, of course, phase four, uh, for those not familiar with our doctrinal phasing, and phase five, restore civilian order. Uh, and that has implications for political solutions or political order. Number five, the non-state actor has proven to be extremely adept at exploiting our seams. Uh, and one only has to note uh, the exploitation of uh, anti-US, anti-NATO, anti-migrant, uh, and all kinds of domestic seams that they uh, can play upon to make our societies come apart. And then finally, exploiting the global conditions or the global environment. We now have, as, as I think you all may have noted on the uh, just recently passed World Refugees Day, we now have a record of 65 million refugees and uh, internally displaced people. That is uh, a historic high. And also, in regard to uh, some of the other root cause conditions that allow non-state actors to take root and succeed, the Arab population, as many of you know today, 60% under the age of 25, and 25% 25 of those unemployed. So that is a very large pool of, of uh, manpower and woman power in which to draw. Now I would like to turn to ISIL as the a uh, case study to exemplify some of this theme of empowered non-state actors. The ISIL leadership uh, not only has learned from the past, but they literally were born from the past conflict, and many of their uh, leaders came from uh, the uh, predecessor organization, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and its other uh, names. It has a very deep bench of leadership, so it has been able to replace uh, those that we, uh, the U.S.-led uh, coalition has taken out. Its organization is highly articulated, both in terms of military and political functions, with shura, sharia, and military councils, with an organization uh, at the national, provincial, and local level, emirs, walis, these, entity, these individuals all perform essentially all the functions of a state. ISIL has become a proto-state, as has been recognized elsewhere. Very adept at the functions of intelligence, as well as counterintelligence, 
uh, enforcement of its laws, tax collection, record keeping. Indeed, one is hard pressed um, uh, to name functions that it has not been able to carry out relatively well. And that uh, despite lower essential services in the cities and territories that it has occupied, it certainly defied early predictions that it would implode of its own uh, in, uh, in capacity and in capability. Uh, in terms of mass, the size of the force is extraordinary. 31,000 is the uh, was the high point according to U.S. estimates, and it's very important to note the ability to regenerate that mass has been extraordinary. Uh, the new lowest estimate for ISIL is 25,000, uh, but I would take. Uh, this, all these numbers you must take with a grain of salt. Uh, but in order to understand the regenerative capacity, uh, I need to ask you to do a little math here with me. Uh, by one uh, estimate, the U.S. government has uh, put out in a non-attribution form, but it has been widely cited, 25,000 ISIL fighters have been killed. So if you do that math, that means they've been able to regenerate about 19,000 fighters over this period of two years of war. That's an impressive regeneration uh, capability. Uh, also on the resource front, an estimated one billion in revenues, uh, and that it's come about equally from the oil and gas revenues and extortion and antiquities trade on the other half. Uh, and they have uh, managed to sustain revenues despite an estimated 30% cut uh, in the last eight months in the oil and gas uh, production they have maneuvered to capture those resources. So there has very much been a method to their madness and one would um, could point most recently to the Libya outpost uh, and the uh, sources of oil revenue available to them were they to be able to uh, take root there and uh, operate uh, either a, a full-fledged affiliate or a potential fallback. Uh, location should they be removed from the core area. Uh, the caliphate itself, of course, has an ideological uh, purpose, but we have noted in our research that it also has a very practical uh, purpose. That caliphate unifies the disparate uh, members of the group, the foreign fighters uh, coming from across the globe, as well as those Iraqi and Syrian entities, uh, fighters that are part of that entity. Uh, social media, this is a huge topic in which ISIL, the non-state actor uh, par excellence, has been able to, to dominate and leverage uh, this method of war. They use it as successfully to recruit, to indoctrinate, to organize, to propagandize. They have a highly variegated structure, again, at the, uh, in terms of the Iraq-Syria battlefield. They have local, provincial, and regional structures, and then they have an entire international operation. And as um, the broadcast platforms have been taken down. They have moved to peer-to-peer -peer sharing, so they have proved very adaptive in their uh, technical aspects of their communication strategy. And of course, they have very robust Arab and English and other languages. Dabiq magazine is held up as their um, sort of hallmark publication, uh, but they have full-fledged media services, uh, and, and in the operational realm, they have been equally innovative using encrypted applications, including WhatsApp and tele Telegram, and these provide uh, a, a very great challenge uh, for the counter-ISIL coalition. Uh, also, in the cyber uh, realm, the um, fleet of hacker tech expertise they've been able to call upon around the world has been impressive, uh, including the uh, hacking and release of servicemen's data, uh, calling on hackers as far flung as Australia and Malaysia. Uh, and I would note, even though Twitter has been very active in taking down uh, handles that uh, broadcast ISIL messages and propaganda, uh, it is very, uh, they, they regenerate overnight. And they're also much more active. 
the uh, recently uh, touted statistic of six anti-ISIL Twitter handles for every one pro-ISIL handle excludes the fact that the pro-ISIL uh, uh, Twitterers are much, much more active, much more engaged. So what to do? So in terms of responding to this type of threat, uh, the U.S. and the coalition has ramped up military operations and retaken territory um, by the U.S. official statistics. About half of the territory seized by ISIL in Iraq has been retaken, about 20 percent of the territory in Syria. Uh, and I would wager that there will be now a predictable move back to uh, guerrilla warfare, as well as the continued focus on the external operations, both affiliates and inspiring the lone wolf uh, actors. Uh, the the game-winning strategy, though, for them is if uh, ISIL is able to count on and even encourage uh, the failure of the coalition and the Iraqi government in executing the phase four and phase five uh, adequately. The uh, U.S.-led coalition has set up a $100 million stabilization fund uh, as, as the funding for doing phase four operations uh, in Iraq and Syria, but unlike our participation previously in the previous phases in Iraq, there is no uh, U.S. or other uh, boots on the ground actually conducting and supporting stabilization operations. You have three million Iraqi IDPs. Some 700,000 have uh, returned primarily in the Tikrit and Saladin area, but this is a real, I think, risk to rely solely on the government of Iraq with the UN agencies in support to accomplish this. And just recently with the, the uh, recapture of Fallujah, that has generated about 85,000 and additional uh, IDPs. Uh, Mosul and Raqqa, of course, would generate uh, many tens that, that amount. And then phase five, I think, is the most important Achilles heel of all. Um, they're, they're, and the solution does not necessarily need to be a unified Iraqi state. It's possible that could be a solution in decentralized form, but the main point is the lack of any political condominium will doom what Secretary Carter has called for as a lasting defeat of ISIL. Uh, and while this audience may say, well, that's fine, but that's not a military job, I think that uh, as the primary executors of this strategy, uh, it, it is incumbent upon this audience to, to think about this. I would like to say a word about an innovation that I see going on in this. I've been fairly gloomy in my comments about the counter-ISIL fight to date. Uh, there's a heavy reliance on indigenous forces to fight this fight. This indeed it distinguishes it from the previous uh, efforts. And those are both regular and irregular forces. And in the case of Syria, of course, entirely irregular forces. About 25,000 of the Kurdish um, YPG, Syrian Kurdish force, about 5,000 of the Syrian Democratic Force, a painfully slow effort to try to get the Syrian Arabs uh, to fight ISIL rather than Assad, which they would prefer to fight. And then in Iraq, about 15,000 uh, foreign uh, tribal fighters in Anbar and an effort to raise about the same number for Nineveh in the campaign in Mosul. So to conclude, I think that I would sum up the challenge here, uh, and I will credit my, my former RAND colleagues, John Arquilla and David Ronfelt in their seminal book, Net Wars and Networks. I think the challenge today is for governments and militaries as essentially hierarchical organizations to become more network-like. I think that is potentially the most important reform to be able to succeed not only against network non-state adversaries, but indeed as states uh, pursue these same uh, tactics. And I know the U.S., uh, the Pentagon is very focused on what it calls the third offset strategy and the types of technological uh, advances and investments that may uh, lend itself to the next uh, phase of war fighting. But I would submit to you that this 
uh, organizational change and this intellectual change could be equally important. And I want to salute the work that uh, is being done now in the UK on this front and look forward to discussion. Thank you.